In this video, you are going to discover three different ways to actually profit from inflation. By using these simple methods that nobody's talking about, you can make huge returns at Compound year after year. And make sure you stay tuned to the end of the video because I'm going to show you where to use these strategies and where not to use these strategies. It's incredibly important you understand that. So stay tuned. Question. All three methods have one thing in common. What is that one thing? If you guessed 30 year fixed rate debt, you win. I'll explain why this is so important very soon. But before I do, I'm going to think of it this way. A 30 year mortgage doesn't exist in a free market. I mean, it may shock the Americans that see a 30 year mortgage and think that's just normal, but it really doesn't exist outside of the United States. It's subsidized by the taxpayers and our government. The reason it's subsidized is because the banks are almost guaranteed to lose money on that type of loan. So if the banks are guaranteed to lose money, you are guaranteed to make money. Method number one, buy property with 30 year fixed rate debt and you'll realize short term gains if the property goes up just with the rate of inflation. Check this out. So this is you, a very sophisticated investor, obviously, and you take your money and you buy a $100,000 home. To buy that home, you put a $20,000 down payment. And in the first year of you owning that home, let's say inflation goes up by the rate of 10%. That increases the price, doesn't increase the value of your home. Because remember, it's just gone up with inflation. It only increases the price of your home to $110,000. So the price has gone up by $10,000. And to restate one more time, the house in and of itself has no more purchasing power. It can't buy any more goods or services. But remember, you only put down $20,000. So your cost basis is only 20 grand, but the price of the house went up by 10. So you have to add that 10% to the $20,000. And when you do that, you actually get additional purchasing power above and beyond the rate of inflation. Because if your $20,000 would have increased with the rate of inflation, that would have gone to just $2,000. But you have an additional $10,000. So that spread is actually purchasing power or ROI that you get on your $20,000 just for the value or the price of the home going up with the rate of inflation. There's been no appreciation here, no real gains in the price of the house itself, but you have almost had a 50% gain on the amount of money that you have in the house. Method number two is buying a property with 30 year fixed rate debt and getting long term gains. To help you understand this, I want to briefly go through how inflation works. We've got a house here. We've got costs of goods and services, food, education, car, health care. And here we have your income. And over here, we've got your loan. Again, fixed rate. It doesn't go up or down. And let's just pretend for this example that there's $60 in the entire world. So your home costs $20. The cost of all these goods and services is $20. And your income is $20. If I go ahead and double the money supply, if I put on my hat that says the Federal Reserve and increase the money supply to $120, what's going to happen to the cost or price of this home, goods and services, and your income? Naturally, it will double. So this will go, your, the price of your home will go to $40. The price of the goods and services will also go to $40 and your income will go to $40. You may say, well, that's great. My income just doubled. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't matter because the cost of everything else just doubled. But look, your loan is still $5. That's the only thing that didn't double. 
Here's the way it works with your income. It starts right here in year one and goes all the way up to year 30. Keep in mind, just like I said before, just because your income is going up doesn't mean that you can buy more stuff. It doesn't mean that you're richer. It just means that your income is staying consistent with inflation. But look at your debt payments. Even though inflation is going up and up every year, your debt payments stay the same. And the discrepancy, the difference between your debt payments and your income is money in your pocket. That is actual purchasing power. I think it makes even more sense if you take that wedge and flip it upside down. Now this is your income, this line, and I like it when it goes straight because it gives the impression that it's staying consistent with inflation and not buying any more goods and services. But the value of your debt is actually going down. You're repaying that debt with cheaper dollars that don't buy as much goods and services. But there's a catch. What's going to disrupt the increase of purchasing power that you have by leveraging inflation is the interest rate that you have to pay on this debt. So that, depending on the interest rate you have and inflation, that is gonna level this out. And it all depends on what the inflation rate is relative to your interest rate. So if your interest rate is 3% and inflation over that time has gone up by 6%, then the spread between the three and the six is increased purchasing power to you. But if your interest payment was 3% and inflation didn't go up at all, then you're actually going to lose purchasing power in the long run because the amount of interest that you will pay the bank will exceed the amount that your income went up due to inflation. So the takeaway for method number two is if inflation exceeds your interest rate, you're making money. But George, what about deflation? This is a very good point because deflation has the opposite effect of inflation in the sense that it makes the debt actually more expensive. The good news is if you use these strategies in the correct location, and again, we're going to discuss that at the end of this video, even with deflation, you still should do well. I'll explain that further right now in method number three. Number three is owning cash flow positive rental properties with 30 year fixed rate debt. It's the exact same wedge that we used in the last example, but here we've got this straight line with our debt payments and this green line is our rental income. So as inflation increases, so does our rental income. One thing that I didn't clarify on the last segment is these debt payments are the principal payments. It does not include the interest. So you could say, well, George, those interest payments might cut into your cash flow. So it really depends on the interest rate that you have and the rate of inflation. But that's not true because let's think about this. And in this case, your renters are paying the interest rate. What? So if the interest payments would normally cut into your increase of purchasing power with a home where you actually lived with a rental property, it won't do that because this is completely paid for by your tenants. So the total discrepancy, the total delta between the increases in rents and the payments is all additional cash flow in your pocket. It is true that your rental income would most likely go down if the economy went into deflation and your debt payments would most likely stay the same. So the delta between your debt payments and your rental income would most likely decrease. But let's take it one step further. If the economy did go into deflation, what would most likely also happen is interest rates 
would probably go down. Now, I'm not saying bet on this because interest rates right now are at 5,000 year lows. The chances of them going any lower are extremely slim in my opinion, but it is a possibility. So if interest rates went down in this scenario, you could refinance your original loan and hopefully that would get the loan moving at this trajectory. So the differential between your income and your debt payments would remain the same. It's not a given and it's not for sure like it is on the inflation side, but it gives you an opportunity to potentially hedge. There are some areas that you completely want to avoid buying, even with 30-year fixed rate debt. San Francisco, Los Angeles, Portland, Seattle. There are others out there, but these are the big ones. And why should you avoid these cities? Extremely high prices, historically speaking, relative to inflation. Really bad government policies, high taxes, rent control. They're really based on asset prices. So if asset prices go down, meaning the stock market crashes, you're gonna see real estate prices, especially in areas like San Francisco, really struggle. Same thing with interest rates. If you see the interest rate cycle start to reverse and go up for the next 20, 30 years, these areas are gonna have big problems because the prices are so high and there's so much debt in the system. Some of these, especially Los Angeles, the population increases are decreasing. The amount of increase has been steadily shrinking. So by the time we get to 2020 or 2021, you might even see the population decrease in the state of California, especially in areas like Los Angeles. And a lot of these areas have really bad homeless problems. That's a kind of an anecdotal thing, but if you see a city with a bad homeless problem, that's something you really want to avoid. So where are the areas where you should buy? Those are areas like Kansas City, Nashville, Little Rock. And why should you buy in these types of areas? because prices are much, much lower, historically speaking, adjusted for inflation. They've got much better government policies. They are not connected to asset prices. Although they are connected to interest rates, they're not as heavily tied to interest rates because there's a lot less debt in those markets. And the population is gradually increasing. So if you want to know whether you should buy or not buy, specifically in your area, check out this video right here where I actually go over a formula that'll help you quantify and make that decision better. And I will see you after you make that next click.